Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, we know what happened. Uh, the world fell into a state of uh, sin and human suffering. And when Israel began worshiping false gods, then they no longer treated each other with kindness and, and love. And when the church began to, to, to blend all kinds of, of different philosophies and, and Roman ritualism, you know, in with the word, then darkness began to descend upon all of Western civilization. And it remained in that state of darkness for about a thousand years. It remained in that state uh, until a call went out during the Reformation to return to the Word of God alone. Sola Scriptura. The Word of God alone is our only source of truth. There's always been two, uh, what you'd call, might call entities in the world claiming to be the church, but only one of them is the true church. The other is an apostate. She's a harlot with other lovers on the side. And using the name of Jesus, she goes around seducing people away from the truth of the Word in, uh, in an effort to convince them that, uh, that, well, they'll be the wiser for it. You know, no, no need to just get rid of God. Just, you know, add the current wisdom of the world to the teachings of Christ. And, and uh, what you get really is a jumbled up, mess that's no longer the truth. We're going to talk a little bit about our present context. We've been studying together in the first epistle to John. We're in the second chapter and we're somewhere around the area of verse, verse 19, 20. So we're going to be talking about that in this video. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, asking that you would take and filter out all of that which is not true, but just seal to our hearts that which is, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, a lot of Christians today, I, th I think they understand that it was, the, it was the false church who burned people at the stake by blending in uh, Greek philosophy and Roman ritualism and false teaching in with the doctrines of Christ. And it was the false church who went against science and uh, by blending uh, other natural philosophies into the doctrines of Christ. It was the false church who su actually supported slavery by blending racism in with the doctrines of Christ, and it was the false church that, that wove Darwinism into the doctrines of Christ, and it was the false church who supported Nazism by blending in the latest philosophy and, and Darwinism and New Age occult type stuff in with the teachings of Christ. And, and that burning, that torture, that, that tyranny, that slavery, the Holocaust, uh, all the ignorance, the, all of the abuse has never been caused by a faithful Christian who loves the Word of God and keeps its doctrines pure, but it's always been caused by an apostate Christian system that tosses aside the Word of God for other sources of wisdom. And we can see this same challenge today in our own generation, especially now. I mean, how many Christians have gone astray by blending in into the truth, Darwinism, psychology, uh, uh, prophetic revelations, quantum physics, uh, political ideologies, business principles, mammon, that's, you know, the prosperity gospel, angelic visitations, and the list just goes on and on. You know, Islam, Mormonism, you know, the pursuit of a false unity 
You know, doctrine divides. We know that. New Age spirituality, the doctrines of men, the doctrines of demons. Folks, this is the age we're living in. You know, and whether or not a person is faithful to the scriptures is a sure way to, to discern whether a person has become apostate. We've been looking at the, a context here, a particular context. This is the Antichrist system. And so we're going to kind of hover over the, uh, this subject here for the next, probably the next couple of videos. If a Christian places other sources of knowledge or wisdom above or beside the teachings of, of Christ, the, te the sure teachings of Scripture, they're going astray in, in, in much the same way as an unfaithful spouse. 1 Corinthians 4, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. This, this word apostasy is, is from the Greek word uh, apostasia. It means a defiance of an established system or authority, a rebellion. It's an abandonment or a breach of faith. And in the first century, Apostasy was uh, a technical term for political revolt or defection. And just like in the first century, spiritual apostasy is alive today. Folks, there is another call going out today for a return to the basic tenets of Scripture. Uh, a, a new reformation, you might say, or a return to the truths which the church returned to during the Reformation. And, and it's critical that, that it, we all understand two things. One, how to recognize apostasy and apostate teachers. And, and why this apostate teaching is so deadly. So I've got some verses I want to I wanna bring into this topic of discussion. And many of you are familiar with these verses. Some of you are not. Some of you have heard me talk about these before. I don't think anyone has ever heard me bring such a collection together of, of such verses that I want to present, bring into the, into the discussion here to, to get you to thinking about uh, this in a more serious way. It's been my prayer, dearly beloved, for years that the Lord would take and seal to our hearts all of all of our hearts the truth of his word and to filter out all of the the ignorance all of the error all of the foolishness that we see going on today I love you all dearly and I appreciate your continued interest in studying this book as always, I've never asked anyone to agree with me on anything. That is not the issue. I'm not, I'm not interested in, and I'm not looking at, at building a following. Uh, I'm, I'm nobody's guru, okay? I want you to think about these verses, and I want you to think about them very seriously. Because we are living in an age, I believe, in which we are running out of time. The problem with mainstream Christian thought today is that it's a total departure you know, from conservative biblical theology. And as a result, generations, we're talking about generations here, folks, that includes your family members, generations of people, they were drug away from some of the most basic truths concerning the faith. And because the whole system is predicated on what you must do to be born again. And it would seem to me that anybody, that, that anybody that's read this book would scratch his head once in a while and they'd say, well, what, do, what did I do to be born? I mean, the first time. I didn't, I didn't tell my mother and dad, hey, I'd, I'd sort of like to be born. I didn't tell my mother and dad, I believe in you. And if I really believe you... Uh, if I really believe that, that, then you'll 
you'll born me. Okay, you know, it seems to me people forget the meaning of words, and I think they're important. I think words are important. Society today is trying to redefine the word marriage. You can't do that unless marriage doesn't mean what marriage used to mean. And there is in Christianity, more than any other discipline, there's a loose use of words that's beginning to creep into our other disciplines. And I think that that's wrong. God says, when you come to me, bring with you words, not pictures, not ideas, not emotion, words, his words. And so I want to go through some basic scriptures. These are basic scriptures that, that, that people either don't understand the words or they reach conclusions that I don't think the scriptures warrant. And you can look at these and you can decide for yourself. And I repeat again. Nobody has ever been asked to agree with me. Most of you don't. What I believe my job is here is to teach the Word of God the best I know how. And your responsibility is to examine the Scriptures every day to see whether or not these things be true. When we look at the book of Jude, we see that there will be a constant fight against false teaching and that Christians should take it so seriously that we agonize over the fight in which we are engaged. Moreover, Jude makes it clear that every Christian is called to this fight, not just church leaders or ministers or pastors or Bible teachers. Jude says that apostasy can be subtle, that they've crept into the church, and it's been said that the worst forms of, of wickedness consist in perversions of the truth. Ultimately, the sign of an apostate is that he eventually falls away and he departs from the truth of God's Word. The Apostle John signifies this as a mark of a false believer. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. That was verse 19. And I talked a little about that. Speaking to his disciples about the religious leaders of his day, Jesus said, Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. So until Christ returns, which we're looking forward to eagerly, the tear will be present among the wheat. And scripture says apostasy will only get worse as Christ's return approaches, I believe, personally, it's my belief, I don't ask anyone to agree with me, that we are in that age of apostasy and, is, and it is becoming increasingly worse, and it will until the day that he appears. And so many will fall away and will betray one another and they'll hate one another. It was Paul that, that told the Thessalonians that a great falling away would precede Christ's second coming and that the end times would be characterized by tribulation and religious deceivers. 2 Timothy 3, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. So let's look at these verses. Matthew 1.21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Who's he going to save? Does that verse say that he shall make people his people? Who's he going to save? His people. So they're already his people. So save can't mean being born again here in this passage. It can't mean becoming a Christian. They are already his people. He redeemed them. Saved means delivered. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. There's, there's a very popular saying. I hear it a lot. There's several things that God can't do. And one of them is, well, he can't make you love him. Well, they must not have read Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. I'll force you to love me. That's technically what the verse says. 
And we're going to see here in 1 John, we love him because he first loved us. Of course he made us love him. Not, it's not something he can't do. It's something he, in fact, did do. He came to deliver his people from their sins. They're already his people. Before he ever came, they were his people. Matthew 9, 16, no man puts a piece of new cloth into an old garment. Every Christian I know, dearly beloved, is familiar with this passage. No man puts new wine in old passage, in, in a, or no man puts new wine in old bottles or it'll be corrupt. Now, so what's he saying? He, he says, I'm not going to make the old new. I'm not going to put new stuff in that old creation. I'm not going to put the Holy Spirit in the flesh. It's going to be in a new bottle, and we're going to see that new bottle in the next chapter. The new man, which cannot sin. Matthew 7, 17, a lot of Christians love spending time in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew chapter 7, verse 17, every good tree brings forth good fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, can't do it. Now, the question is, how does this tree become good? And modern evangelism says, well, it becomes good because of something that you do. You were a bad tree. You were an evil tree. And by repenting, believing, accepting, no matter what you come up with, you suddenly become a good tree. But you have no scriptural warrant for that. Christ didn't say in this context, in the seventh chapter of Matthew, how you go about becoming a good tree. He simply pointed out that good trees bring forth good fruit and evil trees do not. It doesn't take any scriptural intelligence to realize that the good tree is your new creation and the old tree is your flesh. And just as we find in Galatians, the flesh cannot bring forth good fruit. Can't do it. And yet modern Christianity, in the main, is trying to force people to make the flesh bring forth good fruit. Can't do it. Can't happen. Only a good tree can bring forth good fruit. 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He is a Already righteous. He didn't become righteous by doing righteousness. The verse doesn't say that he, he became righteous by doing righteousness. He does righteousness because he is already righteous. That's what the verse says. How has all this happened with a new birth? John 1, 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Dearly beloved, nobody was born again by any evangelist or any personal will, but by the will of God. It couldn't be any clearer. Did they receive him and then become born again by the will of God? No, they received him because they had already been born by God. This is, this is putting the cart. It's not putting the cart before the horse, okay? I've mentioned this on numerous occasions. God gave us a cart. He gave us a horse. Are you going to hitch the cart in front of the horse? You know, I've been asked, Steve, what difference does all this make? You know, okay, so I, be I believe that, that, that as a result of my, my believing or my accepting or my repenting or, or whatever else, what, as a result of that, I became born again. And you say that we became born again. And as a result of our being born again, then, then we were able to believe and receive and accept. And, and so we stand on opposite sides of the fence. What's the big deal, Steve? Why does it even matter? And my only answer to that, dearly beloved, is that if it didn't matter, God would not have said it. it. It will make a difference, not only in our lives now, but we carry this with us, folks, when we leave here. And the Lord appears, and we're going to see a verse at the end of this chapter that might sort of shake us somewhat uh, into understanding that reality. John chapter 3, uh, three chapter 3 of John uh, verses 6 through 8, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit, the wind blows where it, where it lists, 
and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. That's a perfect passive, folks. That grammatical construction declares that it has nothing to do with us. Passive voice. They were born anew, born from above. I, I personally, I prefer born from above rather than born again, but that's, that's neither here nor there. The word means both. How was that done? By the Spirit. It was done by God. John chapter 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, okay, H-A-T-H, -H, hath, already has eternal, everlasting life. Already has it. Now, now, you tell me, what warrant do I have for preaching that if you will hear and if you will believe, you'll have, hath, you'll have everlasting life? The verse doesn't say that. If you are hearing, and if you're believing, dearly beloved, listen to me, please. If you are hearing, and if you're believing, it is because you presently, present tense, you have everlasting life, and you'll not come into condemnation. You had nothing to do with it. You passed from death to life. That's why you believe, because you have passed, perfect tense, from death into life. Only a believer can believe. You don't become a believer by believing. Clearly, the verse declares that hearing and believing is based on life. They wouldn't hear and they wouldn't believe if they didn't have life. Folks, if you weren't alive, you, you would not be able to do anything. The only reason that you do anything in your life is because you were made alive. You were brought into this world. You were given life first. Life comes first. Life comes first. You can almost take that those three words, life comes first, and put that as a headline summary of this entire ministry of Blessed Hope Forever. You were promised to Christ. You're a child of promise. Isaac was promised to Abraham and Sarah 14 years before he was born. What part did Isaac have in that? Dear, listen, dearly beloved, what part did Isaac have in that in God promising Abraham and Sarah 14 years before he was born? He had no part in that. And so even so, you and I are children of promise. You were promised to Christ before you were born. You were promised to Christ before you were born. That's what the text says. God is not slack concerning his promises. And there's people destroying that verse in 1 Peter. God is not slack concerning his promises to us. You are a child of promise, just as Isaac was a child of promise long before he was born. You were promised to Christ before you were born. That's what the text says. 1 Peter 1.23, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, by the word of God, not because you believed anything, received or accepted, but by the command of God. 1 John 2.29, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. He wasn't born of him by doing righteousness. He does righteousness because he's already been born again. Again, it's a perfect passive. 1 John 3.9, Whosoever is born of God, perfect passive, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's another perfect passive. Unless you believe that the new creation can sin, which, which I don't, the old creation does nothing but sin. But the new creation cannot sin because his seed abideth in him. That's what we're going to see here in the very near future in our study. 1 John 4, 7, everyone that loves has already been born of God. That's another perfect passive. You don't become God's child by loving one another. You love one another because you've already been born of God. That's God's order, folks. We've reversed it. The world has reversed God's order. It's a perfect passive. We keep seeing perfect passives. This is a construction in the Greek. We see it over and over and over again. 
1 John 5, 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Another perfect passive. They weren't born of God because they believe. They believe because they were born of God. 1 John 5, 4, all who are born of God overcome the world. Again, it's a perfect passive. If you have been born of God, you had nothing to do with that, and you will overcome the world. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you're not in Christ, you're not his. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, You've put on the new man, which, is after, which after God has been created, that's aorist tense, created in righteousness and true holiness. It doesn't say you ought to put on the new man. Not you have a responsibility to put on the new man. You're living like hell and you ought to be living like heaven. It doesn't say that. It says you have put on the new man which was created in righteousness and true holiness. You didn't create it. Okay. The text doesn't say that you created it. You, it says you are... You are going to say that new man which was created by God in righteousness and true holiness can sin. Is that what you're going to say? A new creation, righteous and holy, cannot sin. The new man cannot sin. We saw in our study in Colossians chapter 3, you have put on the new man. Again, not something you can or should do. You have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge after the image of the one who created him. You didn't create him. You did not create him. Christ did. And then there's the matter of belief. Big word in the Christian uh, picture of, of all things, the word belief, the one word belief. Revelation chapter 2, 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Not if you'll believe, you'll get ears to hear. doesn't say that. If you don't have ears to hear, you can't hear. you got to have ears in order to hear. And, and you didn't get those any other way other than by God. John chapter 8, why don't you understand my speech? Because you cannot hear my word. That's what our Lord said. That's what he's saying to those who are not his. Why don't you understand my speech? You can't hear my word. And over the years, people have said, well, you know, who do you preach to? I just preach to the air. If you're not God's sheep, you can't hear. There's no sense, folks, in me wasting my energy, wasting my efforts, trying to make you hear. And I see that all the time. You know, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do something else. Folks, if God hasn't worked in you, you cannot hear. You know that they have ears. You know, you know that. And they can hear those sounds. But the words, folks, don't make any sense. John chapter 8, verse 47, he that is from God hears God's words. Those, those are the only ones that can hear. You don't hear them because you're not from God. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you are not of God. And the appeal of modern evangelism today, folks, is for you to do something to become his sheep. And the normal thing that you're asked to do is just belief. Sounds so innocent. Yet Christ says, unless you're already my sheep, you cannot believe. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, not of this flock, of them also I must bring. I must bring. Nobody else can bring them, folks, but him. What do you suppose those sheep are? Every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Dearly beloved, one is a believer because he's been born from above, and at some point in time, they will hear, just like Paul did on the road to Damascus. And that person is headed for heaven. Whether they presently believe it or not, they are headed for heaven. Why? Because Christ died in their place. If they are his sheep, they will hear. Our Lord said they would. Now, it'd be nice, you know, if they knew all that Christ had done for them so that, you know, they'd be rescued from their sin, but such ones are already God's child. If you can show me a verse of Scripture, any passage of Scripture that would lead you to believe that one of God's children is going to go to hell, then I'll change what I've just said. 
Therefore, the promise is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ in order that it might be absolutely certain for all the seed. What we preach is a message that is absolutely certain to all the seed. If you hear and believe the gospel, Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day from the dead, it's because you are already his sheep. You are already his child. You may or may not believe that and be his child like Paul once was, but believing it makes a wonderful difference. You're freed from error. You're freed from the law. law you're freed from lies. You're freed from the fear of death. You know, it's worth folks going around the world to tell people, but to put out the idea that a loving Heavenly Father is so powerless that He would allow His children to go to hell is anti-biblical. What I believe it does is demean the person in the work of Christ. My God is God. My God, folks, can look Pilate in the eye and say that He wouldn't have any power if it were not given him by God. God didn't give that extraordinary power to us. And for good reason. I think the concept of being rescued from your sin is being relieved of the conscious guilt of sins. He Hebrews chapter 10, the one who is under the sacrifice of Christ has no conscious guilt of sin. And to me, the primary purpose of understanding what God has done for you in Christ is to remove that conscious guilt of sin. I don't care what you did 20 years ago. You know, even if you think it ruined your life, I absolutely tell every one of you listening, you should have no conscious guilt of sin. My little children, I write unto you because your sins have been forgiven. That's 2.12. I have grand news for you. Jesus Christ died in your place so that your sins are forgiven, washed as white as snow, removed from as far as east is from the west, sought for, not found, remembered no more. You stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. We don't go around the world trying to make people believers. What we do is we go around the world, whether it's on a boat or a ship or a plane or through the internet, we go around the world preaching the gospel, and if they are God's child, they'll hear. If they're not, they won't. And the context of the chapter that we've been studying is the spirit of the Antichrist, which is related to the children of the devil, who we know he's, who, who has arrayed his messengers as messengers of light. We have that in Corinthians. They are in the pulpit, okay, arrayed as messengers of light. That's why you have the Scriptures. That's why God tells you to search the Scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be true. Thank you all for your continued interest, for your love, your support, your prayers. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.